What's going on, guys? It is Brian Jack with Simmons Comics, and we are hitting you with that three up, three down. That's right. We're talking about comic book market trends. We're giving you three on the rise and three of that on the decline. But Jack, how's your week going so far? Oh, busy week, Brian. Busy. It seems like everything's ramping up. But you know what? Cannot complain so much going on. Tonight, we are dropping another Simpleman's Comics and the 616 Comics exclusive, exclusively on simplemanscomics.com and the 616comics.com. And it is the brand new Seven Secrets number one, that hot independent creator-owned series from Boom Studios and Tom Taylor, the second print exclusive variant set. That's right. Not the first print, the second print exclusive variant set we have an exclusive variant for the second print as well as a variant cover and we are homaging the great first appearance of miles morales and ultimate fallout four those were two iconic second prints and we thought why not take this second print and bring those second prints uh back to life if this uh new series starring this character casper and if you're not reading seven secrets definitely check out seven secrets number one but so that is on sale right now simplemanscomics.com and the 616comics.com limited to 500 undressed or virgin copies of each cover and as a bonus there is a limited rare version uh we've got a color hold of cover a as well as a black and white ink version of cover b both of those are limited to just 100 copies and only available in bundles. So yeah, that's available right now. Like he said, some men's comics.com as well as the 616 comics.com. We'll put links to those in the description as well. And huge shout out to Glad Malnikov who did those covers for us. I think he got as close as he possibly could without actually doing a Miles Morales cover. We like those covers because we saw a lot of parallels between the Casper character and Miles. So definitely check those out, like we said. And with that being said, let's get into the three up portion, starting with Robin King. Yeah, Robin King is the hot character of the moment in all of comics, really. And it, it, it's interesting, too, because it comes on the heels of DC having the last major hot character with Punchline. So there's a string going here um, with DC Comics and their, and their kind of current publishing. And it, it, a lot of it has to do with their home run hitters, whether it's James Tynan or Scott Snyder. Um, you know, this Dark Knight's death metal series, Robin King, you've got the parallels to obviously Batman Who Laughs. So this was kind of like an expected thing. Um, and very similar to Punchline, where you've got the Hell Arisen, we've got the, uh, the one shot, as well as now coming with Dark Knight's Death Metal number three and the heat behind that book with the uh, Federici variant, which featured Robin King on the cover, as well as um, the uh, various store exclusives, including our channel sponsor, Frankie's Comics, who got that amazing Peach Momoko exclusive that sold out and is banging on the secondary market. But, you know, Robin King is on fire. Everything Robin King is going to be doing well uh, going forward. Um, seems like the market is really behind this character. Right. So we got Robin King that's super hot in comics, especially DC. But on that Marvel side, we also have that Donny Cates Venom that always kind of seems like it might lose a little bit of its luster. And then, bam, we got something else coming, and it's definitely hot again right now, right? Yeah, it, it's funny because we talked about Null a couple of weeks ago. We keep finding it seems like different creative ways to bring up Donny Cates and what he's currently doing. Um, but it just seems like he's always hot. It just It's a different area um, that's popping off right now. And right now, it's the current run, right? This, and when I say the current run, I, I mean the current arc, the current issues. Um, 26 and 27 have just been lighting the market on fire. Um, a lot of spoilers coming out ahead of 27, which definitely drove up pre-order prices, sent the book to second print before the first print came out. You also have in 26 and what that's doing 25, um, the free comic book day issue, everything related to kind of codex, everything related to virus, everything related to, um, uh, you know, the, this upcoming alternate version of Agent Venom. All of that has people excited. A lot of first appearances, a lot of speculation too. Like yeah. Donnie leading up to the big December Marvel event. Right, right. The King in Black. And, and I think what really frustrates speculators is also what creates the excitement because Downey doesn't give you everything in one shot ever. He drags everything out. Everything is little breadcrumbs. You've got to follow the trail. And it ends up causing this like um, kind of heat up the ladder 
of, of issues. And it's funny because I don't think he's doing it intentionally. I think he's just trying to sell comic books. And um, and I, when I say sell comic books, I don't mean secondary market. I don't think he pays attention to the secondary market at all. I think he's a first market guy. Um, and it just so happens that that drives the secondary market crazy. Um, so I expect we'll see these uh, this title as well as some of his other stuff showing up on that hot side or the upside of this list. Yeah, he's definitely a lot of people relate comics to movies, right? I, to me, he is the equivalent to like Scorsese and Coen Brothers, as you say, where he draws the storyline out with these big payoffs where it almost, or even Tarantino is big at that, right? Where it's like, hey, that movie was great, but it kind of took a while to get, ha- to get where stuff happened. Either way, great book. Everyone's loving Kate's between Venom and Thor, but Venom's on the list this week. Yep, yep. So it seems to be alternating, right? Which one we're talking about. Are we talking about Venom or are we talking about Thor? Yep. But the last one for the three up this week, we're talking about cartoon comics. And we also saw, speaking of cartoons, Hulu's bringing back Animaniacs. I'm excited about that. And that's part of what we're talking about because there's a lot of discussion about revitalizing and rebranding and kind of reimagining some of these cartoons that specifically were popular during the 90s. Red and Stimpy? Animaniacs, Red and Stimpy, Beavis and Butthead um, are all going to get kind of their own um, spotlight, as well as some of the more modern ones like SpongeBob getting a spinoff with Patrick. Um, I think that we're going to continue to see more and more, especially as we develop these streaming platforms, right? People are looking for content just galore and it, it, it cartoon content specifically is one where it's like my kids just recently got into the simpsons um that you know and it, that's probably like 20 years after that or before that um so the streaming platforms allow these things to be revisited and then some of these things are just going to be reimagined i know like og beavis and butthead fans are, are kind of want that kind of mike judge classic touch right but it's it's a very 90s property and the jokes play to kids of the 90s. Um, and if you want them to play to, yeah. you know. They change out music video uh, footage with like memes or something. Right, right. They're going to have to adapt it in some way or else it's not going to it's not gonna play the same way. Um, and then even certainly the style of music that was popular in the 90s isn't popular um, in, with the mainstream today. So you got to make those changes. But either way, what's interesting is we've actually seen movement in the comics market. Um, and we've seen this even like when Disney Plus came back, right? We saw, uh, or when, when it launched, we saw Gargoyles pop off with the, and then the announcement of uh, a Jordan Peele Gargoyles uh, uh, film. And we saw uh, DuckTales start to do things. And we saw um, X-Men Adventures start to do things. So that, there is definitely a precedent here. And these were books that long were kind of like niche you saw them in dollar bins quite often, to be honest with you, are starting to become books that I think we're going to have to start paying attention to going forward and possibly looking for other um, kind of cartoon properties from these this era, as certainly there seems to be a trend with streaming services picking up these properties. Yeah, and we talk a lot about nostalgia. We talk about cartoons. We actually have a video on this very channel with our top 10 cartoon comic book series, right? Yep, absolutely. And definitely there's some great ones on that um, list that very well could end up getting picked up. So there's the three up portion for this week. So we're going to shift right down into those declining trends within the comic community, starting with one we got a lot of news on Twitter over the past few days. And we're talking about what the heck is going on with DC Comics. Yeah, so the comics community was definitely hit with some bad news that there were some massive layoffs at DC Comics. And I want to make sure we talk about this, Brian, in the right context, because this is on the down portion of the list, because really it's just unfortunate that any this happens in really any industry, um, but it happens in the industry that we love right now. It's affecting a lot of people, certainly within DC Comics and without. And I think you have to have empathy for the people who are going through this, because this has happened with almost every business within the pandemic um, where there have been cutbacks, and especially within companies where there are, are uh, parent companies who are answering to, say, stockholders or board members. We, Brian, you and I are 
uh, big WWE fans. And that's a company that's extremely profitable and actually showing record profits yet had 40% layoffs, very similar to what we saw with DC Comics. Um, but I say that, and I make that comparison for a reason, because I also don't think that this is a time to say take a victory lap if you're a Marvel fan, because it really doesn't have anything to do with Marvel versus DC. Um, I don't think, I think that where people start to get silly is when we start talking about like uh, Disney buying uh, DC, AT&T not printing comics anymore, um, IDW getting a DC license. Those are all really kind of like silly topics at the moment. I think you have to understand that this was a very strategic business thing. Um, it's not like any of the creative teams were, were affected. Uh, this was a top sort of situation. Um, this was a change in management um, and probably a change in approach and a change in style. And you have to remember Dan Didio was, was let go and really an interim was put in place. It wasn't really like a, a full hiring process. Um, so uh, the editors were let go. Mo a, a lot of the people like things like DC Direct um, people can be kind of shocked about that, but DC's kind of gone back and forth with DC Direct over the last few years. And I think the licensing out of the properties to uh, McFarland Toys was an example of how they can make money without having to be the producer of the figures. And, and, and that saves a lot of money. And I think this is going to open up the door for new licensors to come in. I think we're going to see DC products on shelves with more companies, which I think is a positive. Um, also like the DC Universe app, right? So writing was kind of on the wall with that app. Brian, you and I have talked about that on several programs on this yeah, show. Yeah, like who, who, who didn't see that coming? Right, I mean, between, have, with having HBO Max and the DC Universe app, that was redundant from the get-go. And we know as entrepreneurs who have started a business trying to get traction in your business, it takes time, right? So why would DC Universe go through all this process of trying to get this traction and HBO is doing it. HBO is a bigger platform. It's, it's only natural. It's, it's, it's spending money for two things when you only need to do it for one. So that wasn't really news to me. So I think people are blowing this out of proportion. And I say that with all due respect, because I'm not minimizing the massive amount of job loss that went on. A lot of people lost their job. A lot of people's families are going to be affected. A lot of people income. A lot of people lost their dream job. That's the other thing. Think about, Brian, guys like you and I, an opportunity to work for DC Comics would be a dream job for me. Um, so I can't imagine what it would feel like then to be let go from that dream job. So I hope all of those people bounce back. A lot of those people are extremely talented and they will end up with other companies um, or some of them back with DC once things get healthy here and, and maybe DC goes to hire. And a lot of those positions, like I said, specifically relating to like the streaming service app or the toy line, that's just unfortunately a part of business as companies look to kind of refocus, reshift. Yeah, and by no way, like Jack said, we do we need do we intend to be insensitive with those that were affected? We were just saying that from a comic standpoint and the point of our fandom, we shouldn't we don't feel like we will see much of a drop off. The comics are still yeah. there. In fact, we mentioned it. We feel like just as Jack just said, there's a resurgence right now with DC mm -hmm. Comics. But we always say that's cyclical too. Like back before. Um, Marvel was kind of on a downswing when DC was out with New 52. Rebirth came. We saw Marvel kind of rise up again. And now we're also seeing DC Comics start to come back with, you know, a lot of people, the James Tynan run with the Joker War and a bunch of other Tom Taylor books. There's been some great books. I've always been a fan of Josh Williamson's Flash, but that yes. runs ending as well. But either way, DC Comics is here to stay for now. But that takes us to the next one on the three down. And we are talking about pre-sale prices between and i'm not even seeing this we're seeing this now with actual we talk about the secondary market but we're seeing that retailer market also raising pre-sale prices i don't know what's going on but i'm not a fan of it and it's definitely deserves to be on that downward trend yeah i don't have a problem with what resellers are trying to do online on ebay that's secondary market right something's only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it what i don't like is the first market who dictates the price um that saying of like something's only worth what somebody's willing to pay especially when you're a retailer slash distributor distributor that's and that's where you have the most power right and that's where you have an idea of print runs and popularity of products um that that distributor that we're speaking of 
um, being being Midtown Comics has that Federici Robin King variant that we're talking about, which is an open order variant of a not a first appearance for ten dollars, Brian. Ten dollars for that. Shame movie. on you, Midtown. I mean, that's just punk ass it, bitch. It's just you know. Again, I say it on the channel all the time. You know, I know I always get these people who falsely quote me economics of oh, it's a free market and this, that, and the third. But the market only stays free when people respect the rules of trade. And if you're the first market. Um, you need to stay the first market. And uh, especially if you're going to dip in kind of a step below the first market and also become the distributor. And it's not just Midtown. We're seeing it across the board, right? Um, I, I look at a lot of pre-sale, pre-order pricing um, to try to base my own expectation of what variants that maybe I'm pre-ordering or incentives that are attached to, say, the exclusives that we're producing. And it's very hard to, to gauge pricing when I'm seeing these these pre-order prices we used to talk about like back in the day you didn't pay over ratio ratio was fair and then you aimed to pay less you wanted to pay half yeah. but you you would try to go anywhere in between there nowadays like i'm not seeing ratio anymore Brian. especially if it's a popular book um, that was a, that was also a way to tell if you didn't know if you weren't in the know that what the ratio was on the variant by looking at the price <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah if it was 25 dollars, you knew it was a 125 um, and you're just not seeing that. Like the DC Comics 125 variants that we're seeing are regularly being pre-sold for 60 to $70. And what I really think it's really highlighting and really shining a light on is dealers are not using incentives and publishers are not using incentives for what they are truly designed for. They're to incentivize retailers to order more copies of the book. Instead, they're being sold as the product. So I've said this before when we talk about like Marvel Tales. If a store is ordering, say, Robin King, right? Robin King number one, you are going to see that incentive, that 125 incentive, probably pre sold for 75 to 80. And I can predict that without even looking because I know that the book is a $5.99 cover price book, which means it's $3 to dealers, which means it costs $75 to get one of those 125. So what they are doing is they are selling the variant for the total cost of everything. And then any books you sell are free. So then they bundle up those books, they sell them cheap, they make their profit on the books. That's not the way it was back in the day. Back in the day it was, well, I know I can sell this for $25 easy because it's gonna be a popular book, and then that will make my books cheaper. And it, it's changed now um, as dealers go from focusing on selling the books to just selling the variants. Uh, it, I think it hurts our market a bit. And I, I think we need to kind of correct that, but it's tough, right? How do you do it? I'm, I'm here pointing out the problems. I don't necessarily have the solution. DC tried to solve that by eliminating incentives altogether. And I don't think that necessarily did it. And as soon as they came back with incentives, there was a fervor for them, so now they're not going anywhere. So I don't know. Let us know in the comment section what you guys think and then what you see as the solution. But um, I, I think that ultimately incentives are a good thing for the market, uh, but they are being often abused uh, by pre-sale dealers. Yeah. Free market capitalism, they can do what they want. Doesn't mean I have to agree with it or use my buying power and spend the money on the books so yeah and they, they can, can listen for what they want i'm not buying it I, I, that doesn't mean that i can't disagree with it and think yeah. they're a punk ass bitch for doing it so right that's, that's, that's the thing is. is they have the right to do it it doesn't mean that doing it is what's healthy for the hobby yeah. which is going to take us to the last one on the three down portion we we're talking about exclusive variants lacking exclusivity yeah, and this See is that five times fast Right, and this is a new one to me. And I know a new one to you, Brian. So I think this is why we wanted to talk about it because I think it's a, um, a it would be a new one to a lot of people. And um, for me, like I will say, like this segment is brought to you by ExclusiveVariants.com because if you're not familiar, Brian and I also run a website called ExclusiveVariants.com, and the website has really just a positive approach to the market. We really just want to highlight all the great work that stores are doing to create exclusive variants and unique collectibles um, for various publishers and creative teams. It's really that simple. There's really no ulterior motive to the site. But in doing it, we started to learn a confusing aspect of the market, which is that most retailers have partners. You know that us at Simpleman's Comics, we have a retail partner with the 616. This helps mitigate risk 
helps us kind of spread out the marketing. Um, but some of these variant producers are also on top of any partners they may have wholesaling copies to other retailers. And we're not talking about like one or two. And this is kind of commonplace. Our channel sponsor, Frankie's Comics, who has a partner, Golden Apple Comics in, in California, they will sometimes wholesale copies of their books to Comic Kingdom, who's located in Canada, or to Forbidden Planet, who's located in the UK, which makes total sense. It, it allows more customers to be able to access the books without having to pay some exorbitant shipping rate. But that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is books that are created and then broken even on by wholesaling out to dozens of stores, and thereby not making these books exclusive to really anyone, although they may have the store's logo on the back. They're sold regularly. And if you're following a lot of retailers on Instagram, you will see this whether you realize it or not. When a hot book gets announced, look at the last Ronin books. Look at the next time a hot Venom book gets announced. Wait till you see how many different retailers are posting that they have quantity of that book available for sale. And if you're like me, I always wondered how does that happen? And what I ended up learning was the fact that they were buying wholesale. So when we entered this market, that was something that we got approached with immediately was the, you know, are you guys going to sell wholesale? And we didn't mean anyone any disrespect, but we don't want to do that because we want to continue to have our variants be exactly what they were intended to be, exclusive to Simpleman's Comics and the 616. So if you buy the comics from us, you know that you're getting books that you are getting, that we like created, we worked with the publisher, we selected the artists. A lot of times we even planned the cover art ourselves. Um, and we put that level of work into it. Uh, it's not just a product that we are reselling like every other product. If that's not done by everybody the same way. Now, you may not care, right? You may say to me, you know, Jack, I don't care. I really don't care if it's a great cover. I don't care who makes it or how it's done or what it is. But I've heard so much griping and complaining about the exclusive variant market and specifically about the way in which these books are approaching. This is something I haven't heard talked about, which I do think affects the market because I think because stores are able to do this, they're able to produce more books, which, which it goes to the gluttony of exclusives you see. There's more incentives produced because of it. Um, there's more books that stores don't really care about because they know that they can wholesale out a bulk portion of them and break even. Books like these virgin versions of second prints or third prints or virgin versions of that uh, Carnage variant that's real popular or something like that. Um, you see a lot of those type of things. That kind of stuff, the reason why you're able to do that is because you're able to wholesale. So these, a lot of these retailers, they're only trying to sell 25%, 20% of their print run. Um, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about it, but for us, it was one of the obstacles that we have entered into this marketplace as we try to establish ourselves as an exclusive producer of comic books. So um, let us know in the comment section if you've seen some of this, if you've seen it on Instagram, and if not, be on the lookout for it. And uh, again, not telling you what to do with your money, but trying to keep you informed so you can make the best decision. Uh, there's a lot of places to buy comics. And there's a lot of producers of comics uh, and, you know, that's up to you where you spend your money. But if those things are important to you, we want to keep you in the know. Yeah, I think there's a little bit, I won't say divide between the community and what they think. I'm sure there's some people that, yes, they want an exclusive that it's exclusive. I also think there's somewhat of an audience that's like, I don't care where I get that from. That cover looks cool as shit. I'm going to get it. Right. And there's plenty of places to pick it up for. If it keeps going the way it's going, you want to even name it exclusivevariance.com because – Right now, that site's to show you where that book is coming from, who has it, who's printing it, who's putting it out. Pretty soon, everyone will be putting out every book. You won't need it. But either way, it's another one that's kind of on a downward trend, but it's also what's ruffling feathers and something that, as Jack said, maybe you guys weren't aware, and it's something that we wanted to bring to everyone's attention. But that's it, guys. That's a three up, three down. But hey, don't go yet. Don't go yet. If you guys check out twobrotherscomics.com on YouTube today on their channel, they also just announced two more Simple Man's Comics 616 variants. Which ones are those, Jack? Well, of course, we're coming back with Boom Studios, which we only find them when they're dead, number one. 
You can't do the Tom Taylor book and not do the Al Ewing book, the two biggest free agent signings in all of comics. So we're coming with that awesome Cosmic Odyssey book. Um, amazing exclusive variant from John Boy Myers. Uh, we've been a big fan of John Boy's for a while, so it was really cool to get to work with him on this cover. 500 print, again, exclusive undressed uh, virgin cover, uh, $24.99. And we've got two. Instead of just one, we've got two limited versions. We have a black and white cover limited to 250, as well as a black and white cover with that awesome color hold with that uh, glowing eye that you see on the cover that was also used by John Boy Myers on a Venom cover. That, that is limited to just 100. Those are only available in bundles. We also have the incentives. So if you're looking for that 150 Jenny Frizen, we've got that loaded on the site as well. And we started our exclusive variant journey, Brian, way back when uh, with another organization with Mad Cave Studio. So it's only right that we bring it back where it all started. And we're doing that with Stargazer number one, the brand new release from Mad Cave Studios. This is a limited virgin cover, 200 printed, uh, 1499, uh, brand new number one coming from the good folks at Mad Cave Studios. And again, we only find them when they're dead and Stargazer go on sale a week from tonight, August 19th, 9 p.m. Eastern on SimpleMansComics.com as well as the 616Comics.com. As always, let us know in the comments what do you think's hot, what do you think is cold. This is Brian Jack with Simpleman's Comics. We'll see you in the next video. I feel I'm in the mood for a switch up. I hit the function, hit the rose light till I hiccup. I hit the stage and leave with money that's a stick up. She picture perfect, so I told him I'm a